Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I wanted to resume a series of videos on the philosophy of Jordan Peterson by doing the first in a series of two videos on 12 rules for life. This video will focus on the first half of that book, rules one through six, and the next video will focus on rules seven through 12. Now, some people might find it strange to talk about the philosophy of Jordan Peterson since he's actually, um, technically a psychologist, but the interesting thing about him is he did not begin his academic journey as a psychology major. He was originally more like on a path to do law and studying political science and political philosophy. And if you actually read him, he actually references um, the existentialist philosophers like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, and he displays a familiarity at the very least with Heidegger's being in time, um, and of course a lot of interest in Dostoevsky and other existentialists. So it really is not a contradiction to talk about the philosophy of Jordan Peterson. Now I think that um, it's also very important to focus on the book 12 Rules for Life in particular because um, there's really only two books that Jordan Peterson has ever published. And the first one, Maps of Meaning, from all the way back in 1999, certainly a very good look into the sort of psychological thought of Jordan Peterson with regard to how does the human person operate in familiar and unfamiliar territory in accordance with how uh, science understands the brain. That's basically his first book. But um, a lot of the insights that he's known for scattered over many viral YouTube videos talking about political issues and um, self-help and the social justice movement and Marxism, a lot of that stuff is really to be found um, in distilled form in this book. So the thing about Peterson is either you can look over many different YouTube videos for thought, but a lot of what he says in those videos is going to be um, presented quite clearly in this one book. Now, 12 Rules for Life, once again, is the only book that Jordan Peterson has published other than Maps of Meaning since, uh, which was uh, published all the way back in 1999. It's also a quite different book from Maps of Meaning in the sense that Maps of Meaning was written um, with a schedule of working three hours per day over 15 years to produce the book. And it is a very dense book. Some people have reacted to that density either with a feeling of um, being overwhelmed, a lot of other people within the um, Jordan Peterson phenomenon have been swept up by this, um, reacted to it with a sense of uh, being mesmerized by it. There was a story of a guy who sent a copy of Maps of Meaning to his brother in prison and remarked that other oh, guys in prison were just mesmerized by this book, it became like a thing of fascination um, for them. And it is definitely a really good book, but uh, Jordan Peterson um, didn't write another book after that until 2018. And his original plan to write a follow-up to the book uh, was something that he started writing in basically the same way that he had written Maps of Meaning in the 80s and 90s. And he ended up scrapping the whole project and redoing it as a totally different kind of book. He redid um, 12 Rules for Life as a much less technical book intended to be accessible to a popular audience. And in fact, the origin of 12 Rules for Life is also interesting in the sense that it began as a Quora comment. So Quora obviously is a website where anybody can ask a question and the answers are ranked or they're displayed, I should say, not on a chronological order, but based on a type of ranking system where people will um, upvote a comment they really like, and somebody asked the question, like, you know, give me a, a list of things to do to live well, and Jordan Peterson personally um, responded to that, and actually um, gave a comment which a lot of people were liking, it was it was um, ranking pretty high up within the list of all the responses, and that basically sort of became the book 12 Rules for Life, responding to the question, what, what does a person need to do to live well? And that just um, demonstrates, I think, the way that the 21st century is turning out to be a really weird century for where the great books are coming from because you know in previous centuries maybe they were coming from like the um, the academic institutions or something like that but in this century uh, great books are really coming out of unexpected places like John Michael Greer writing Art Strude Report as a blog or Ted Kaczynski writing great works from prison um, and then of course Peterson writing a great book from a Quora comment um, and 12 Rules for Life is certainly a book 
which is not like a Euclidean system of building up systematically result, valid results from foundations, um, which arguably maps to meaning is much more like, and the um, stylistic liberty, which Peterson takes in writing this book. Um, it results in a lot of statements um, that might be um, quite uh, difficult for somebody with a philosophy background to maybe make sense of precisely because he makes so many statements about being in the style where he has this sort of freedom to be uh, actually rather ambiguous. So it's not a book like Heidegger's Being in Time in which precisely the point of the book is to clarify what does being mean. It's a book which he never actually provides a coherent answer and a lot of his statements about being in this book will actually seem outright contradictory. Um, to a to a philosopher, but I think that um, it's not proof that he's not doing philosophy. Rather, it's proof that Peterson at heart really is still ultimately interested in philosophy. And Twelve Rules for Life is a very important book um, for the where the current discussion on philosophy is going. So he opens the book with kind of a quick review of his philosophy as presented in the uh, maps of meaning from 1999. And this is basically built on the argument about the fact that there's only one world, obviously. He's not like a dualist saying, well, you know, there's this world and then there's Plato's world of the forms, or, you know, there's appearance and then there's the thing in itself behind it. He's really more interested in the way that like the, the world is only one, but you can't exactly um, you can't exactly have the world without it being construed in one of two ways. Okay, so there's no neutral world which is not construed either as a place of things or as a form for action. But it's not that the place of things and the form for action have the same basic constituent elements, in which case one of them would just be a flawed or failed version of the other. One of the mistakes people make about talking about the scientific revolution is they assume that, well, obviously, before Isaac Newton and Galileo, um, medieval and ancient and prehistoric people were just doing the same thing as them. They just weren't as smart as them, so they were they were failing to grasp the uh, the world as a as a place of things at the scientific level, and instead gave us this mythological nonsense because they just weren't as smart as Newton. That's actually a mistake because. Um, construing the world as a place of things, which is what science does, gives you basic constituent elements, kind of the material out of which you sort of make the world as construed that way, decomposes to the things familiar to scientists. Um, so you do have constituent elements like molecules and atoms and subatomic particles. P Peterson is not saying, obviously, that you don't. But he's saying that if you construe the world as a form for action, then the basic constituent elements of the world are not going to be those material things. The basic constituent elements are going to be order and chaos. And he mentions elsewhere, and the process of consciousness as a mediator between the two. Okay. And he says that myths are therefore not descriptive. Inherently, they are not giving us scientific descriptions, in which case they would be epistemologically um, oriented towards essences, which tell us what things are. Okay. So they cannot be evaluated as like primitive or failed attempts to do sounds. Myths rather are moral. And since myths are moral, okay, they deal with um, personalities more so than objects. So when he talks about order and chaos, those really are construed as personalities. Um, and they are also um, factors for how we live phenomenologically moment by moment as beings who af actually have to live in a real world. In a sense, we have um, a distinction that we know between order in which we're within familiar familiar territory in which people and things act predictably and they act cooperatively. They act cooperatively with our expectations about them. Okay. And um, the brain certainly has one system, I guess, where the body as a whole has a system for when it's in familiar territory. But then, of course, there's also, because we are beings who live in a real world, there's always the possibility of anomaly. And that can go from the trivial, in which case, you know, there's a minor delay while you're driving to work. So you have to wait for five minutes before, you know, like a, uh, uh, something gets cleared off the road, whatever. But then there's also catastrophic anomaly in which maybe you spend nine years in graduate school getting your PhD, preparing for an academic career, and then find after nine years that who you thought you were and the life you thought you were going to have basically is not 
anymore. Uh, because if you're unemployed after a PhD, you are no longer the professor you thought you were going to be. And that is the kind of anomaly which gives you chaos. And he assures that humans will pretty well do anything to avoid chaos. Um, he mentions that the Cold War provided a lot of the, um, the motivation for him to explore mythology um, at a serious level, because the Cold War for him was a, an example of people literally willing to destroy the world over two belief systems. And the thing about belief systems is obviously these shared belief systems are important because a shared belief system simplifies the world and it also simplifies each other. We also are more able to understand each other uh, according to order rather than chaos according to these belief systems. But of course, um, shared cultural systems stabilize human interactions by providing this isomorphism between what is expected, what is believed, and what is desired. But such a, his uh, such a system is inherently hierarchical, since the system achieves order precisely through valuing things in a certain way. And if you're valuing some things, that means you're valuing them more than maybe things that you don't care about, but you're certainly valuing some things more than others as well. And a lot of the um, um, academic um, discourse today that focuses on blaming hierarchy on the, met the meddling of willfully evil figures in capitalism or in the West or um, among white men or whatever, you know, nonsense the, the uh, social justice movement is, um, you know, putting out the thing, hierarchy only exists because of capitalism or whatever, okay? Um, it's something Pearson notes that the concept of hierarchy at its most general level is not unique to any one of those things, okay? Pearson notes that even the action that you are politically inspired to take against hierarchy, if you're, you know, professor, um, actually being financially compensated very well for um, within your own academic hierarchy, um, above adjuncts, etc. precisely in your publications where you're rallying against hierarchy, um, action against hierarchy is itself dependent on hierarchy because value, which motivates action, is inherently hierarchical. And therefore, action is not possible without some hierarchization, because action only occurs with an implicit relation to some goal. But if you have a goal, that means that some X is valued above other things, which is hierarchical. And even something basic as perception would be impossible without value and hierarchy. He notes that, um, our understanding about the brain and the, the body's um, sort of systems today is, is um, something, it, it confirms that uh, perception is actually physically expensive. And it's so expensive that we only process a tiny fraction of the total sense data that's ever actually given to us in total at any moment. And we only have perception as something coherent on the basis of some teleological orientation that is in accord with the hierarchy of values. And he notes that um, the absence of value, therefore, is not going to be freedom. If you remove value, you instead get things like anxiety and horror. And in fact, you lose meaning altogether. And therefore, a major factor in Peterson's intellectual development was a phase of life where um, the importance, obviously, of value and meaning as avoiding chaos led to the bizarre situation in the Cold War in which um, the nuclear apocalypse literally seemed like something that was a plausible event that could happen. And he, for a certain phase in his life, he had recurring nightmares um, about a nuclear uh, catastrophe occurring within his town. And the recurring nightmares drove him to research dream interpretation and then later on mythology in general, because this type of interpretation of the, the symbolism in dreams was just a type of more specific version of um, being able to read mythology in general. And the Cold War showed him that two sides were willing to end life on Earth for two belief systems, which were actually pretty historically contingent. That's the most bizarre thing about it, because capitalism and communism are both super specific to like the 20th, 21st um, centuries under fossil fuel industrialism. Um, and yet, if we accept that no value means no meaning, um, then obviously a problem is going to emerge when value systems are equally subjectively meaningful because in the world construed as a form for action, the criteria is not to penetrate to the essence of what the thing actually is. The criteria is whether its significance 
in relation subjectively to your plan and how the world is ordered as me as familiar to you okay so that means that conflict is inevitable okay because rather than having some final um elucidation of this of the essence of the thing as an object and so you're dealing inherently with subjective values okay and beyond the bleak options of chaos and fighting to the death for an entrenched belief system he says there really is a third option there and that's the hard work of developing the individual by situating oneself on the borderline of chaos and order. And he thinks that if you do that, you'll be able to engage in productive exploration of novelty. So it's not that all novelty is going to be encountered as chaos. In fact, novelty emerges with the type of um, inducing us to the instinctual and behavioral reaction to actually take curiosity and actively explore it. Okay. So he says that if you do that the right way, you can have personal transformation without falling into the madness of chaos or equally maybe the madness of clinging to order even at the cost of life on earth. So he says that if you don't take his advice to try to situate yourself there and try to grow as a person, you have an alternative and it's victimhood, which leads to resentment, which leads to envy, which leads to vengeance, which leads ultimately to destruction. So to start with the rules themselves, rule number one is stand up straight with your shoulders back. Now, one of the things that Jordan Peterson is best known for these days is the talk about lobsters, which occurs in this rule famously. And he says that, you know, lobsters are important to talk about if you really want to understand people because they have large, easily observable neurons and 350 million years of evolutionary history. So um, lobsters were there with the dinosaurs, okay? And lobsters also allow you to take his principle that objective knowledge is possible with regard to even something as complicated as maybe like um, the understanding of the brain, okay? Because you can actually observe as a scientific essence what's going on there with lobsters, okay? And he says that that shouldn't be read as like an analogy for how humans function. Um, because they actually just provide a direct intuition of pre-human natural categories, which are older than all of us and yet still an ingrained part of our thinking. One of the more interesting theories that Peterson has in this book is that um, categories of thought are maybe not like Kant's transcendental a priori um, categories, which are, you know, that's unique to the rational subject. Um, nor are they just purely fictitious. He does think that the some of the categories of thought are actually natural categories, which lobsters also display. And um, that is why it's not merely an analogy for how humans work. You actually see maybe the same natural categories at work in lobster thinking. So despite the myth that territorial disputes are unique only to the West or to capitalism or to men, um, actually territory is a huge problem for lobsters as well. And in fact, as he mentioned elsewhere, last I checked, even the people most against, um, the, even the people claiming they're in favor of deterritorialization, like Deleuze scholars, are still rather territorial about getting funding and academic appointments and their salary and tenure within their own academic um, hierarchies. So let's just admit that territory is something which is um, a huge problem, not only for all humans, but even for lobsters as well. And that's because real estate on the ocean floor is valuable. Valuable. Real estate on the ocean floor, where it's safe, where it's habitable, where there's access to things you need to survive, okay? That's valuable stuff. And it's sorted out not completely arbitrarily. It's not like a you know, free-for-all where anybody can go anywhere they want. It's rather sorted out on the basis of a hierarchy of status and position, um, which might actually make human systems seem just in comparison. So as living creatures, however, lobsters, although there is a a system in place for how that real estate is divided on the basis of the status. There are some lobsters with much higher status than others. Anomaly is a constant threat because no matter how um, well ordered a given system of uh, of anything might be um, at the at the maybe level of significance, okay, because we're existing as real beings in a real world, anomaly is a constant threat. And sometimes a top lobster can get into a fight with another lobster and get outdone and lose. Afterwards, interestingly enough, its brain will basically dissolve. 
as it has lost its sense of self-identity and order has given way to chaos. Afterwards, that top lobster will grow a new subordinate brain more suited to its lower position. That's the most bizarre thing about his discussion on lobsters, by the way. Um, and sorry for the noises, there's a power outage, once again, um, second one today that I've observed here in India. So um, and the most bizarre thing is like um, uh, losing order will actually like rot your brain, literally. So um, the Pareto distribution um, is something therefore, which is obviously one of the most controversial things about Jordan Peterson's philosophy. And let me just make sure this is working. Literally, so um, the Pareto distribution um, it's something there for Okay, so with Pareto distribution is that um, hierarchy is not due to the willful meddling of the capitalist only. I'm not saying, by the way, that capitalism is not grotesquely hierarchical. Um, and, you know, I'm certainly not saying that as a pro-capitalist statement. You know me as uh, critiquing capitalism as just another form of fossil fuel uh, living. But of course, it, it's still wrong to say the hierarchy is only a result of capitalism, the West, men, whatever. Because the Pareto distribution shows that in any creative endeavor with a variability in terms of outcome, um, you're going to see a pretty reliable distribution of those outcomes according to something like this, in which vast majority of people are going to achieve something close to zero. You can see all the way over here. The vast majority of um, endeavors are going to yield a return of very close to zero. A modest minority will get a small return, and a hyper minority will get a huge return. So if you think about things like classical music, there's been a lot of classical music composers over the centuries, but almost all of the classical music that's actually played today is by four composers, Bach, Mozart, um, um, Tchaikovsky is his name, the guy who did the Nutcracker, and um, Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven's the fourth one, okay? And even among Bach's work, only um, a percentage of it, which he had this enormous output, is actually regularly performed, okay? So um, the Pareto distribution is something which, at the very least, we can confirm is empirically something that describes the way things turn out. And it's paired with Matthew's law, when the verse in Gospel of Matthew, it says, to him who has been given nothing, even what literally has, what he has will be taken away from him. And to him who has been given much, he'll be given even more. And he says that these are not mystical explanations for inequality. In a certain sense, Matthew's law in particular is just the positive feedback loop um, in action, because if you already have a lot, that's a positive feedback loop where it's easier for you to get even more. On the other hand, if you have nothing, I guess that makes it easier for you to lose what little you have. And so that we can understand these outside of the loaded, um, the ideologically loaded arenas of human endeavors like capitalism, communism, even classical music, etc., by looking at lobsters, because with 350 million years of evolution, Lobsters display that the dominance hierarchy, as he calls it, in which real estate on the ocean floor is divided up on the basis of the dominance hierarchy, where some lobsters simply rank higher than others. Okay, um, And it is enforced at some level through brute force, but that's still the case. Okay? And he says that the dominance hierarchy is a permanent feature to which all complex life is ad adapted. You find the same thing with chimpanzees. Obviously, you find the same thing with humans. It would be absurd to argue that you don't, even, of course, within the same academic hierarchies where deconstructivists and Marxist tenured professors fight tooth and nail to keep their status that is much higher than the adjuncts who are teaching low-level classes. Um, so the di dominance hierarchy really exists. It's not a side effect of any any idea, um, any of the um, things I mentioned already, or ideological illusion, or even human uh, human corruption, which nature lacks. Um, and it's something which also cannot be understood according to money, his idea of natural categories rather than the type of surface level human abstractions. It's, it's deeper even than those. It's something that applies to the dominance hierarchy in the sense that money must not be equated with it um, in the sense that if you're not at the top of the hierarchy, even if you're financially compensated, that won't make you be at the top. And it also won't make your brain 
um, like the brain of somebody at the top. He talks about how the brain of the top lobster has to actually dissolve and become the brain of a lower lobster when it, when it goes out of change. And um, if you knew people who were like baby boomers with good corporate jobs and huge salaries before 2008, who got laid off at their corporation in when the recession hit, they became different people afterwards. Like if you knew people who were baby boomers who never got another corporate job, ever again after 2008, they became like different people because their understanding of who they were within the dominance hierarchy changed. But um, it's not money. And in fact, money won't even help you if you're at the bottom, because if you're at the bottom, which is a very dangerous place, money might actually make things worse because obviously there's going to be a lot of people trying to get it. And drugs and alcohol are going to be maybe even more tempting if you're in a place where a a little bit of temporary relief is going to sound pretty good. So he says that being at the bottom is obviously a very dangerous place. And the biological response to the danger of being there is also physically expensive on your body because you have to be in a constant state of readiness. But that wastes bodies, uh, the body's energy resources that can't be saved later for um, any type of action which would be deferred to a later time, it has to all be invested at the moment to counter danger. And that's why the rule is stand up straight. Because if you try to signal to people that you're not somebody at the bottom, strangely enough, you will no longer be at the bottom because much of what keeps you there is your subtle signaling to other people that that's who you are. That's Jordan Peterson's um, argument anyway. So rule number two, treat yourself like somebody that you are responsible for helping. All right. So as I mentioned, chaos and order are the two most basic subdivisions of being itself. Now that's a weird statement about being, which uh, we don't even have time in this video to unpack what that means. So being itself, let's kind of just start by saying that that means that um, being itself is not intrinsically one or the other. Okay. Um, you get order or you get chaos from being in itself. It's neither. It's not that one is the illusion and the other one's the real thing. Okay. So um, there are also the two most fundamental elements of lived experience. So as, as far as like treating lived experience as a thing with maybe like a material cause that we could break down into its basic elements, the basic elements of lived experience are not contrary to expectation, um, intrinsically, things like molecules, atoms, uh, subatomic particles, um, the fundamental elements are chaos and order. Okay? And these are also not given as objects. They're not given as things. Okay? They're given as personalities. And he says that, you know, you could look at the evolutionary theory that we have a hyperactive agency detection within our um, within our biological systems and that we evolved to see that we were surrounded by personalities. We did not evolve to feel that we were surrounded by things or by these objective situations. And as personalities rather than things, he argues quite controversially that chaos and order have gender. Gender is therefore not a human social construct. It's not a result of capitalism. It's not a result of the West. Um, it's a natural category, he says, that's at least a billion years old. And he says that um, gender um, is not the only natural category, which, um, which is often blamed on social construction. It, in addition is family roles. Okay, you know, the, the father, the mother, things like that. Those were also natural categories since our evolutionary habitat was quite literally other creatures, not physical spaces and things. So what he means by that is when we were evolving, the habitat in which that occurred was not a set of objective stuff. Like there's a tree there, there's a rock there, there's a, a, a river over there. Those were actually understood um, to be within a habitat which was populated by personalities. And that's why you find this understanding in um, the, uh, the tribal societies that those things are alive and they have personalities. Okay. So he says that um, our brains are still intrinsically adapted to personalities rather than scientifically purified objects. Obviously, you can get scientifically purified essences of objects in the place of things, but it took centuries of very conscious effort to develop the type of scientific stance towards reality that would give you those. And it's still kind of unnatural for us to do that. And he says that one of the weird things about humans in particular was that we had this growth in the human brain, okay, um, relative to the other hominids, 
you know, um, which, you know, you could say that we outcompeted them. I mean, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. It's not that we literally ran to every um, other type of hominids camp and just killed all of them. It's rather that we just put them out of work. We were better than them at doing the same things we were competing at. Part of that was growth in the human brain. But that led to increased curiosity, which led to increased exploration, which led to increased encounters with anomaly. And therefore, chaos and order were a big part of being human. And they were interpreted through the natural categories that were already available at um, a level which was not uniquely human. And these natural categories were gendered. So therefore, order is masculine. He says in The Little Mermaid, King Triton is the masculine king father who is order for Ariel, which she actually gets kind of bored with. And um, chaos was actually feminine. That's in The Little Mermaid, the character Ursula, who is, um, of course, the feminine chaos. And therefore, he says, the familiar is not just a scientific material thing. Since we exist in time, the familiar always can become the unfamiliar. In a certain sense, it inevitably does. Yeah. It says chaos, obviously, is bad. Pathological clinging to order is also bad. But a proper understanding of consciousness is this mediation between order and chaos. That's going to be key to going beyond the dilemma in a healthy way. And also, you have to know where you're going. And if you have a plan to provide a context in which things are showing up as significances with meaning to you based on where you're going, you're going to also avoid chaos. And he says, you could do that or you could take the alternative, which is the kind of resentment, which is just a hatred of being. And that leads to either wanting yourself not to exist or wanting nothing to exist. And he says a lot of like mass shooters and school shooters, they end up taking both options because it almost always, in addition to stopping being for others occurring, they also end it for themselves as well. Okay. And he says that certainly is one stance. Okay, just make a choice. Okay, so rule number three, make friends with people who want the best for you. So we're all familiar with um, Zola and naturalism, the misapplication of Darwinian evolution to the idea that humans are animals who are completely determined by environment, which means if somebody's life really sucks, it's just because they were a victim of circumstance, which obviously means that we just have to make the circumstances for everybody um, more or less the same. And then, you know, everybody as a product of circumstances is going to turn out equally um, happy, I guess. Um, but he says not everybody failing is a victim. And he says this as a clinical psychologist. Okay, It's like the viral debate with um, Kathy Newman. She, she was asking, uh, what, where, he, where does he get his information about, about people? He says, I'm a clinical psychologist. I, uh, I kind of deal with people's problems for a living. And he says that not everyone failing is a victim. He's not saying that as like Zola writing novels in the abstract or as a philosophy professor who, you know, lectures two hours a week and, you know, collects a salary for, uh, for that for some reason um, <laughs> that is uh, much larger than uh, it should be. But anyway, he says that he's, he says every, not everyone feeling his victim based on his experiences as, as a psychologist actually has to talk to people who have major problems. He says not everyone on the bottom, to go back to the dominance hierarchy, hierarchy actually wishes to rise. Some realize that amplifying their own suffering is a, is a way to prove the world's injustice. And they're motivated by revenge against being itself. The kind of stance towards being as a whole, either of embracing it and trying to further it and better it, or of wanting to take revenge against it and just end it altogether are two of the big options that he mentions here. And he says, often the path up is rejected, not because it's not offered at all, but rather because it's just so much easier to fail. Okay. Um, and he's not just speaking economically, by the way. He's, he's also just speaking psychologically. Like the path upwards to happiness, in a certain sense, is rejected because it's just a lot easier to, um, to, um, to be um, a victim of injustice who has a legitimate reason to be depressed or whatever. He says, in negative terms, it's so much easier to not care. It's, it's a lot easier to not do. It's a lot easier to not think. It's a lot harder to actually do those things. He says that the myth that you can fix a uh, troubled person by just putting them in company with a bunch of good people is actually contradicted by the evidence that shows one bad apple spoils the whole damn bunch in the immortal words of Axel Rose and Guns N' Roses. He says that so it's proved that um, that'll actually just make the good people convert to be like that person. And um, that is 
a contradiction, by the way, of the idea that um, moving someone from one context to another is going to be sufficient to change everything about who they are. This is rule number four. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to someone uh, not to who somebody else is today. So the big philosophical and existentialist question is, who are you? So some people say that like ancient philosophy is about who is man? Well, obviously man is the rational animal, the, the animal with logo, speech, etc. cetera. Um, that's ancient philosophy and existentialist philosophy. The question is, well, who am I? Now, the question is, who are you? The, the difference between ancient Greek philosophy is why is there being at all instead of nothing? In existentialism is why me? Like, why do I exist? And Jordan Peterson is actually pretty interested in that existentialist question as well. He says, well, who are you? Is the subject just a pure fiction? Or do you as an individual have an essence? And in fact, is your essence so stubborn that even you can't will it into obedience to something that it is not intrinsically fit to do or to force it to do something it's not interested in? Let's just say your parents want you to become a dentist. You have no interest in it. They just want to force you to do it because you'll make money, you'll be respected, whatever. You can try to force yourself for a number of years, but eventually it's going to fail. And he says that this, this fact that we all have a nature, we all have an essence, against the deconstructivist celebration that there is no essence to anything or anyone. He says, you have a nature and you should actually listen to it. Even if what it's saying, it sounds crazy because it might sound crazy in the dark where it's still pushed down somewhere deep into subjective in interiority. But when you bring it out into the light of day, it might sound a little less so. And he says, a successful person is not somebody who does exactly what, I don't know, their parents force them into this, this uh, role of the respected dentist, whatever. Um, a successful person is actually just someone who's the right amount different from everybody else. And in Maps of Meaning, he mentions that we couldn't even act if we didn't see the future as incomparably better than the present. And I dare you to try that with your own life. When you think about the future, you pretty much assume it's going to be infinitely better than the present, which is unsatisfactory, even though 10 years ago, you assumed the same thing about where you'd be today. And he says that we do that because we, we can't not do that. Um, if we didn't have value telling us where we're going, <clears throat> we wouldn't even be able to see. And he brings up the, um, the study in which um, a psychologist uh, showed a video of people passing basketballs back and forth where you're supposed to count how many times they do. And you don't notice because you're so busy counting. Um, that there's a gorilla right in the middle of all of them, okay? Like 60% of people won't see the gorilla. And he says that that's because perception is so expensive physically that you can only see um, on the basis of what you're aiming at seeing. And what you aim at determines what you see and what you don't see. And you don't see things, quite simply, that are not relative to furthering the plan to reach your goal. You also don't see things, um, let me put it another way, you see things either that help you reach the goal, or you see things which are obviously obstructing it. So obstacles to the goal are obviously also going to be seen. And he says against the type of linguistic solipsism um, that the world is real. Okay. We are not falling into the type of, you know, deconstructivist celebration when, well, everything's interpretation or everything's language. You're saying, like, there really is a real world there. And it has these primordial axiomatic elements of being. That is to say, being itself has the elements of hunger and loneliness and, let's face it, horniness or eros and aggression and fear and pain. And you're misunderstanding what being is if you think that those are not basic elements of it, okay? And as a real person with billions of years of evolution in you, you are simply too complex to understand yourself. So the interesting thing about Peterson is he does acknowledge that science is possible, that things have essences, that objectivity is possible. But he's saying that you'd be misled to think that the knowledge is perfectly transparent or even maybe that it could be. In fact, the scientific conclusion that there's billions or millions or years, whatever, built into this shows that it's way too complex for you to understand even yourself. Therefore, you have to take an irrational commitment to the goodness of being, despite all of the bad things that are obviously in front of you. And you have to make a commitment to Plato's ideal of the highest good, because the only other alternative is to not be able to overcome all the pain of existence. So rule number five, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. So let me just make sure if there's any comments real quick. Not be able to overcome all the pain of existence. So a couple comments here. Uh, the myth that territorial disputes are unique to the West is a myth. Yummy lobsters. 
okay, so this is not interactive. Sorry, <laughs> I was, uh, didn't uh, quite see the comment at that moment. I was uh, checking for the uh, stream working. Um, Jordan Peterson is a poster boy for some effect. Okay, I have to research that. The power relations between the bad apple and the rest is key. What if the goal is not to have the goal, which is the death drive? Most culturally important artifacts are from playing. Okay, that's interesting. Um, is the death drive non-teleological? That's certainly a Zizekian argument. But the thing about Peterson's critique of Freud is he says, with Freud, there's an assumption that drives are repressed in order to generate acceptable behavior. And the death drive um, in civilization and its discontents is repressed by society because um, unbridled aggression is socially unacceptable and detrimental to a functioning civilization. That's Freud's own argument in civilization and discontents. But Peterson says Freud got that a little bit wrong. His own opinion is you don't repress the drives, you integrate them. So you don't repress aggression and become this docile being waiting all the time for it to explode back into some type of uh, aggressive act. Rather, you become a functional being by learning to integrate your aggression into your drive to accomplish things. So he says like a great football player is not repressing their aggression. They've integrated it into a drive to become a great football player, whatever. Um, so thank you all for, all for the comments. I'll come back to those in a bit. And rule five, uh, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Did parents in society ruin the innocent child? That's another question which philosophers, or let me put this way, professional academics, many of whom are actually not really philosophers, but let's just say like professional academics um, can contemplate that from one way. But as a clinical psychologist, he'll have to... Um, examine it at a less than theoretical level. He says, like, did, did the parents and the society ruin the innocent child? Are all individual problems results of unjust social structures? Can we carelessly destroy imperfect but functional societies on the gamble that some ideological fantasy can materialize overnight to replace it just as well? Um, just as we cannot understand ourselves due to the millions of years of evolution, he argues, we cannot understand why the complex societies, which revolve over long periods of time as well, function only that they do. In other words, we can't understand why exactly it is that the obviously imperfect world around us still functions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in fact, a lot of the behavior for it goes all the way back to chimpanzees and other animals. We only know that it does function, but we can be sure that rapid destruction of something that works is a very risky proposition. And he asks about the very idea that you have an unspoiled human nature, which some historically contingently wrong arrangement, um, like the West, or like um, the patriarchal family, or like um, uh, 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 or capitalism, or whatever, is the sole reason that that was spoiled. He said, "Is it, if that was really the case, like Rousseau's theory, then... Um, why is it that bullying is actually the worst for children? If children are unspoiled, why are they even more cruel than most adults? There was a, um, a psychological study actually where they, um, they uh, sorry, the power is going off and on. Welcome to rural India. Um, they, there was a psychological study where they um, mimicked the, um, the social structure of a middle school classroom for adults in an office. And within a week, they were going to like Lord of the Flies behavior because that's how bad the bullying in middle school is. If you don't remember that from when you were 12 years old yourself. Um, and he says that like, why is it that hunter-gatherer societies also are more violent than, than cities? And he, he means that quite literally. Like before the, uh, the government of like uh, Zimbabwe or wherever started actually regulating the Bushmen, the murder rate among Bushmen was actually very high relative to say a nation like Canada. So um, if nature is peaceful, why are chimpanzees prone to horrific tribal warfare? If you've ever actually seen the video footage of chimpanzees ganging up on a guy, on one of their own and killing him, it's pretty disturbing. He says the reason for this is something we've actually gotten completely backwards. Um, he says that usually we, we say that societal influence on child causes unacceptable behavior, but that's actually backwards. Children already behave unacceptably. What, what is required is shaping them to behave. And that is something you get from societal influence. And he says that it, it's actually not that mysterious. Like violence is easy. The mystery is not violence. The mystery is peace because violence is the easy way out. Peace is what requires 
more difficult to understand. So rule number six, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. He starts with a quote from the Diary of the Columbine Shooters in which they basically question being itself and curse it. There was a quote from uh, one of the Columbine shooters, I think the day before he did the shooting, where he said like, you know, human beings don't deserve this world. Like we, we had our chance with it and we blew it. Like we built a horrifically unjust society and the whole stinking thing needs to just go down. And, you know, he took that seriously enough to say he was willing to go down with it. It's not like he was going to remake, uh, he was going to re- purpose being at the human level into something that would be acceptable. He's just given up on it. He says like, John Pearson says, obviously like questioning being and cursing it in full is something we've all been tempted at some point to do. However, hasty actions of vengeance and revolution really need to be rethought because it's easy to criticize structures of belief for theoretical flaws that you find in them. But you have to keep in mind that those structures of belief are not ideological, um, um, things that just float in a vacuum. They're rather abstractions from structures of society. And those structures of society were built over many, many um, eras. And a lot of it actually goes back to pre-human ways that groups of beings exist together. And they were built also over hard work. So um, neglecting the amount of labor that went into building up what is imperfect but still functions is something that um, you really need to be careful with um, when you're just criticizing the idea, okay? And it's easy to find flaws in the system, or at worst, to just give up on your own being and on being in general altogether. But how can you attack the ordering of the state before you've even ordered your own perception? So the crisis of the youth today, in which many people are not even really able to understand who they are as individuals enough to have coherent perception about where they're going in life, and yet are willing to jump onto Twitter to... Um, uh, to, to share tweets um, about how overturning everything in the modern corrupt society is a guarantee to uh, a, a just society um, on the gamble that somebody's historically contingent ideology, like let's keep in mind, by the way, guys, that Marxism and communism is a historically contingent result of living under fossil fuels. There would be no Marx if there were no fossil fuels, okay? There was no Marx in the Middle Ages because the capitalist, um, communist progression is itself just fossil fuels. This is the, one of the arguments in my book, uh, Being in Oil, coming out in the next couple of days. But anyway, that is what makes Peterson different and really valuable, I think. That's actually one of the best insights he has. So, my book, uh, Being in Oil, coming out in the next couple of days. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and check out. Children are naively evil. Um, uh, what would Hegel think of Peterson? I doubt. Okay, looks like there's a lot of comments here. Great, so uh, thanks a lot. Uh, let me see where if we can catch up. Um, Lacan made those points as well. What would Hegel think of Peterson? I would not consider Peterson to be anything like a dialectical thinker. I think that um, in a lot of ways, the biggest um, philosophical dichotomy um, relevant today is Hegel and dialectical thinking in general and ancient Greek philosophy. Um, and I would group Peterson more with Plato and Aristotle than anything modern, although obviously he has a lot of common ground with um, existentialism. But uh, I would say that he's like Plato and Aristotle. He does believe in this objectivity, but he also believes that what you see is not a direct window into the fullness of truth because like Plato gives you these gradations of truth, a little more truth, a little more being with each level. That's kind of like what Peterson is. And it's like, you do see the world. It's not an illusion. You just don't understand it fully because you need further enlightenment or whatever, something like that. And that's really not Hegel to be honest with you, because for Hegel, you're making a mistake. If you even read the form you're trying to understand as stable, it's something which is itself and, um, going to be swept away by radical negation. That's why dialectical thinkers like um, Zizek say, well, you know, um, throwing away these dysfunctional structures on the gamble that something better is going to emerge is something we actually can do within Hegelian philosophy because um, Zizek ends Year of Dreaming Dangerously, a 2012 book about the 2011 protests in England and Occupy Wall Street, Arab Spring. He says, we don't have to give them a determinate answer what the future is going to look like. It's enough for us to say that the abstract negation of this unsustainable society is going to yield, this, yield something else. That's the biggest difference between Zizek and Peterson. So anyway, um, 
everyone, thank you so much. And uh, look forward to the, uh, the debate uh, tomorrow with um, uh, the topic of Deleuze and Peterson. Thanks for watching.